doing the same thing. Some of it can be malicious and automated. Uh, our tools are getting better each day to determine what is malicious, what is automated, what's, what's not actually real. We're able to see the distinction between how a real human tweets versus how a, a robot tweets. Um, so we're working on redoubling our efforts on, on that regard. And I want to go to Facebook quickly too, but it, it would seem to me that there's a pretty big distinction between objectively verifiable fake things, the, the text to vote right. or fake voter information or voter location or voter hours, and things that are narrative-based where people have competing different world, competing world views and differing interpretations of how facts fit in some overarching narrative of, you know, actual good versus evil and then merely political versions that are the, the subset of those debates. How do you rank order what you should focus on and what's the human capital that you have doing this? So Russia and China and potentially North Korea, Iranian examples are uh, sort of straightforward in the context of the way we've been debating it in the U.S. election. But in the context of potentially jihadi accounts, there's a whole range of the theological interpretation about people who don't quite believe in violence in the name of religion and people who think that's a threshold that, religion, that a certain theology requires of them. Who are your people who do this work? So we, we prioritize safety and abuse. It's the number one priority of the company. And earlier this year, we, we actually repivoted all of our engineering product and design teams to solve this problem set. So that's our number one priority. As a subset of that are things like automated accounts being used by malicious actors to sort of amplify their voice. Uh, we have hundreds, and in, the ter in terms of our entire engineering organization, sometimes thousands. Um, we're a company of about 3,800 employees. So over like half of them are focused on this problem at, at certain times uh, throughout our life cycle. But uh, sort of understanding the intricacies of jihadi theology is not something that an engineer is exactly trained to do. So no. who, who are your content experts by domain? How do you, do, how do you hire for that? We have, a, we have a very respected trust and safety team who, who has to research, research these issues around the world. We're a global platform being used everywhere except for a few places. Um, so we have, we have teams that are researching these issues and trying to dis distinguish what you're talking about between violent groups and groups that may have some connection to them but are more political arms. We've seen many instances of that. Uh, so there are teams who have to sort of tease out the nuances and understand how these groups are acting and how they're coordinating at times. But there are, there are teams that, that research and study these issues and also help us refine and implement new policies around them. Thank you. Mr. Stretch, uh, I'll save some metrics questions for you after the hearing or a subsequent round, but can you tell us just a little bit about Facebook's human capital solution to the same problem? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Senator, for the question. So today, uh, across our uh, safety, security, and product and community operations teams, we have about 10,000 people who are working on safety and security generally, and we're committing to investing more and doubling that number by the end of 2018. On the question of extremist content generally, I think you raise a really important point, which is that we need to understand the behavior and we need to have the capacity both as a company and as an industry to be able to track it and eradicate it. So we have thousands of people who, who as part of their job on a regular basis are, are attempting to keep terrorism off of Facebook. We have 150 people who do nothing else. That's their job. And across that 150 people, they have, as Mr. Edget suggested, uh, in our case as well, significant expertise in understanding jihadi threats. They cover about 30 separate languages. One of the things that each of us has done as a company has worked together to make sure that the industry is sharing threat information and sharing expertise and also providing that information to other smaller companies that may not have the same level of resources. We all agree, not just that terrorism doesn't have a place on Facebook, terrorism has no place on the internet. And we're trying to lead the industry to make sure that we're all doing our part to address that threat. And the last point I'll make is that it also requires an ongoing dialogue with law enforcement, with the government, because there's a, a great wealth of information in the government as it tracks these issues that they can share with us. And that, in turn, gives me some optimism as we address the question of foreign interference in the election. We know how to work together to address a threat on the internet, both as an industry and working with government. And I think if we bring that same concerted behavior to bear looking at this threat of foreign interference in the election, I think we'll make some progress. Thanks. I ran past my time, but I'll follow up with you more as well on your team. Thanks. Thank you, Senator. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to all of you on the panel.
Last, Mr. Stretch, last night, 19 major civil rights organizations sent a letter to Facebook which explained their, quote, deep concern regarding ads, pages, and hateful content on your platform used to divide our country, and in particular to promote anti-Muslim, anti-black, anti-immigrant, anti-LGBTQ animus. The organizations referenced a number of examples that had previously been reported by the media, including a Russian Facebook account that, quote, not only promoted anti-immigrant messaging online, but also managed to organize an in-person anti-refugee rally in Twin Falls, Idaho in August of 2016. The letter also detailed a reported situation in which, quote, Facebook offered its expertise to a bigoted advocacy group by creating a case study testing different video formats and advising on how to enhance the reach of the group's anti-refugee campaign in swing states during the final weeks of the 2016 election. What is your response to this letter? Is it true that Facebook assisted in an anti-Muslim effort? Thank you. Thank you, Senator, for the question. So let me start by saying that the, the content that we've produced to this committee uh, and that was run by these uh, fake accounts masquerading as real authentic uh, identities uh, is vile. And it's vile for precisely the reason you say. It's particularly exploitative insofar as it was directed at groups that uh, have um, uh, uh, every reason to expect us to protect the authenticity of, of, of debate on Facebook. In terms of what we're doing in, in response, we are, we are reviewing and tightening our ad policies, and, and there's two particular changes that, that we're making. One is we are we are, we are tightening our uh, content guidelines as they apply to ads with respect to violence. So much of the content that is so disturbing is involves uh, threats of violence towards communities, and that has no place on Facebook, and it certainly has no place. Regardless of source? Reg uh, regar yes, regardless of source. Um, regardless of source, exactly. We want our ad tools uh, to be used for uh, political discourse, certainly, but we are not. We do not want our ad tools to be used to inflame and divide. Well, this point I'm trying to get to is: I read that set of facts to you. Uh, the trigger word was a Russian Facebook account. At which point, most of us would say, "Hold, hold the mm -hmm. phone. What is Russia doing, promoting anti-immigrant, anti-refugee sentiment in the United States?" Now take the word Russian out of mm -hmm. a Facebook account that promotes anti-immigrant, anti-refugee sentiment in the United States. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you would characterize that as vile. I sure would. These groups would. What I'm trying to get to is this. I think we can all, when we start with the word Russian, fake, trolls, bots, so forth, right. we know the starting point is a trigger. Something needs to be done. The second thing we know is if it includes a reference to a political candidate or a party, Mm -hmm. Then it's in a category two of electioneering. I'll let Senator Klobuchar address that issue. I'm sure she will in a, mo a moment or two. And then the third question gets into what you characterize in this case as vile content. Mm -hmm. How are you going to sort this out consistent with the basic values of this country when it comes to freedom of expression? Mm -hmm. it, it's a great it's a great question. I, 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 don't, I don't suggest it's easy. Uh, we do value personal expression and when that is the purpose of your service, there is going to be content that is objectionable, even beyond objectionable. Where we're really trying to draw the line is with, with respect to uh, uh, advertising content and using our tools to, um, to, to promote messages I'm and promote pages. I'm going to stipulate these are all ads. I'm going to stipulate right. that at the beginning. They're yes. all ads. Yes. They are being purchased to affect an outcome of an election or a voter sentiment or to m mislead voters. I I'd like to ask your colleagues to address this as well. Mr. Edgett, what would Twitter say to that question? Uh, those ads have no place on Twitter, and our ads policies actually address those things. So if there is inflammatory content that, that, that's, that some even would find to be upsetting, that's not the type of ad we want running on Twitter. We distinguish between organic tweets, which are those that you or I or anyone here today can tweet from their, from their phone or computer, from advertising. 
advertising our tweets that are we serving to someone who hasn't asked to follow the content, hasn't asked to be a part of that conversation. So we draw a very hard line on making sure advertisements are not inflammatory. I, I certainly commend you and endorse that, but agree with Senator Sass that when it comes to drawing those lines, it's a challenge for us and we do it for a living. Uh, and I think it'll be a challenge for you as well. Mr. Salgado, would you like to comment on that? I, I agree that it's a, a real challenge. We have policies to keep our ads and, and the uh, uh, high quality. Uh, and the, uh, the proposals we've made and that we'll be implementing around election ad transparency, I think, reflect that as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, I'm very proud that the three companies you're representing here today are American companies. And, and I think you do enormous good. But your power sometimes scares me. Um, Mr. Stretch, how many advertisers does Facebook have? We have uh, approximately 5 million advertisers on a monthly basis, Senator. Did China run ads in the last election cycle that tried to impact our election? Not, not that I'm aware of, Senator. Not that you're aware of. Did Turkmenistan? No, no Senator. Not that I'm aware of. We have... How about North Korea? Turn that off. I'm not aware of, of other foreign actors running the same sort of campaign. How can you be aware? I mean, this is, this is what I mean. You've got five million advertisers, and you're going to tell me that you're able to trace the origin of all of those advertisements? If, if, I want to, if I want to hire a lawyer, if I wanted to hire you when you were in private practice, you have an incredible resume, and say, let's go through about four shell corporations. I want to run some ads, and let's go through four or five shell corporations because I want to hide my identity. You're telling me you have the ability to, to, uh, to go to, to trace through all of these corporations and find the true identity of every one of your advertisers. You're not telling me that, are you? Senator, the, the commitment we are making no, is... No, sir, I'm just asking about your ability. Not commitment. Can right. you do it today? We're not able to see beyond the activity we see on the platform, the, the technical signals that we get from an account. Now, we do think that, that the technical signals we, we see can be used to help us identify inauthentic behavior. The truth but in of the matter.